Okay, how are we doing? Hi. Hey. Hey. Um, how's everyone's first day going? Good? Good first day of NDC? Well, I guess there were workshops, but first full day of NDC. Uh, we're nearing the end of the day. Everybody, everybody having fun? Tired? A lot of learning? Everything good? All of the above. Good. All right, so uh, my name is Jeff Strauss. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is like right smack dab in the middle of the United States. Um, I was just telling my two friends up here, also speakers, Lemon and, and, uh, and Jennifer, are also from the Midwest. And I was like, oh, I just realized it's about 1.20 in the morning at home right now. I shouldn't have thought about that like right now. But we're going to talk about JavaScript um, and kind of where it is today, where it's going in the future, uh, and, and kind of how we, how we see where we get there. Um, the, the general theme of the talk is that JavaScript kind of keeps on expanding. It just keeps growing. There seems to be new stuff all the time. And it wasn't always this way. Right? I mean, for the, for the most part, over the, the, the course of like, the lifespan of the language, it seemed like there'd be leaps and bounds of like, you know, new stuff for a while, and then you know, years of stagnancy right, with the language. And then all of a sudden, there'd be maybe some more stuff. But all of a sudden, these days, the language is expanding all the time. So what we're going to do over the next hour is talk about a few different things. We're basically going to say, uh, you know, what's happening right now? Right? What is the current state of, of the language and the spec? What are some of the new core language features? We're not talking about frameworks or anything like that, just core JavaScript. Um, why is it the way it is? Which is always kind of an interesting question with JavaScript. Uh, and then how do we see it moving forward in the future? Now, uh, before we do that, a quick sort of aside. Uh, we use these terms sort of interchangeably. I mean, I do uh, very frequently. I talk about JavaScript. The talk is called JavaScript Futures. But really, uh, what we're talking about is ECMAScript, and they're not the same thing, right? ECMAScript is a language specification. JavaScript is a language implementation. So when we talk about JavaScript, what we're talking about is not only even one implementation, but many, right? It's an implementation of the standard. And uh, for those of us who have been around you know, a, a long time, writing applications for the web, especially with JavaScript, we know that the JavaScript you write for Chrome maybe doesn't work exactly the same way it does on mobile Safari or Firefox. Um, like it probably never had a chance of working on Internet Explorer in the first place. And so that's because all those different browsers and environments have their own implementations of the language. But what we're talking about is ECMAScript. They're implementations of that standard. Now, a lot of people didn't think about ECMAScript or talk about it really until a few years ago. Uh, when ES6, right, ECMAScript 2015, was released. It was a major jump forward with the language. It almost felt like something brand new. Right? There was all sorts of stuff going on, uh, destructuring and classes, uh, the Promises API, a whole lot of stuff that changed the way we wrote JavaScript happened just a few years ago. It was a lot to sort of absorb, a lot to think about, a lot of ways to think how we could improve our applications. But then, like the next year, there was more. And the next year, there was more. And again, this year, there was more. It keeps going. This is kind of a new thing for us in JavaScript land. Right? And really, what ends up happening is we spend a lot of time thinking about ES next. Right? What's, what's coming? How do we plan? How do we know where we're going to go and build our web applications if like, next year is something new that you know, invalidates or changes the way we're doing things today? And it's happening on a quick cycle. Now, the good news is, and we're talking about how that happens and how these new features come into being, but the good news is, when we think about ES Next, unlike moving from a framework like an Angular to a React to a Vue, we're not talking about that. We're talking about an evolution of the language. It's just like getting a new version of C Sharp. And the people behind the spec, the people who are actually making the decisions about new features are very good about, maybe they deprecate something, but they very rarely have breaking changes in the language. So what that means is if you see something either in this talk or you see something you're reading about new features that are coming into JavaScript, just play around. Pick something new and try it. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't fit, don't use it. Okay. Now, we're not going to go all the way back to ES6, but we are going to talk about uh, this year's spec and last year's. So a few of the things that are new to JavaScript, starting uh, first with ES2017, which officially became the standard in June of last year. So some of these features have been around for a little while now, and you may have seen them already. Uh, but if not, a couple new things. Uh, first uh, point, though, and I already said this before, right? in 2015, we had a ton of stuff. right? ton of stuff. A lot of new things, like the classes and the promises and all that. The nice thing about having annual releases is that it's much more 
bite size. What happened in 16, 17, and 18 is there's a handful of new things. Some of them are big changes, but there's not all that many things to pay attention to because since we know we have an annual cycle, we only get a few features at a time. Uh, first thing, object static methods. So who is familiar with object.keys? Has anyone used that before? A lot of it, good, all right. So object.keys, right, we can take an object, call object.keys on it, and we get what? We get an array of the string representation of all the property names of that object. But what we never had before was object.values, which is the other half of that. There was no way to take a given object literal and pull out just the values of the things, which at first glance may not seem that useful, but we'll see in a minute that it, that it kind of enables some neat functionality. So the way this works is very simple. Say we have, uh, a, a, this is, <laughs> I just, remembered and fixed this like right before I came down. My son, this is my son Kelly, he turned seven on Friday. He's actually seen this talk before and it used to say six and he saw it and then he complained and he said, no dad, I'm six and a half. So I, <laughs> so I, had, so I had to fix it and he turned seven this week. So uh, you got a boy, you call object.values and you don't get the property names back at all. We just get an array of the values of those things. And they're not string representations, right? Like if it's a number, we get the number. It's the number seven and his name Keller. Not earth shattering, right? However, we also have a new, uh, new function called object.entries. Object.entries is gonna take that object literal and give you a, an array of arrays and look kind of like this. This is my, uh, my, my daughter, Madeline, who's three and a half. We call object.entries and we get both things. We get an array and each entry each element of that array is itself an array that has the string representation of the property name and the value itself. No, it is, it, it's all arrays. There's a reason for that. There's a reason they do it this way. Consider, uh, consider we put the whole family together. Uh, arrays are iterable. People familiar with the concept of iterable? It was, the iterable uh, protocol was added with ES2015. So things like arrays, maps, and flat maps, and all that are, are iterable. We can use, use, say, the for of loop on them. You can't do that with an object. We can't iterate easily over an object. But when we take object.entries, that's an array. Which means that when we serialize that thing out and flatten it, now we have a known array that looks a certain way. And we can loop over that thing, which is a for of loop. We destructure it right, into k and v. And now we have an instance variable, a key and a value instance variable on every iteration of that loop. And I can iterate over all the innumerable properties of my object very easily without having to say, like, say object.keys and go back and then use key base access to go back in and pull the thing out. I can just iterate over my object. Kind of a cool little construct. <laughs> string, string padding. Who remembers left pad? Yeah. Uh, for those who don't, um, left pad was, th this is less so much about, like, less about a feature, about a new feature, because it's just string padding, but it kind of shows how the language evolves and can be reactionary to certain things, right? So a few years ago, I think it was a little over two years ago now, there was this library, left pad, it still does exist, uh, but it was one of, I don't know, a hundred and something modules that this one particular open source author maintained on NPM. Um, he had a library called Kick, and so the Kick messaging com uh, app company wanted to do something and they complained to NTM, there were some disagreements, and next thing you know, he took all of his toys and, and went home and unpublished everything and the internet broke. Because left pad was 11 lines of JavaScript that just padded strings because you couldn't do that by default in the language and things like React depended upon it, which means things like Facebook depended upon it and for a short period of time, like nothing built. And the, uh, the, the wise people who helped us define the standard said, uh, oh, and now we have string padding. It was like the fastest feature to ever go through the process to get into the language. Uh, it works very simply. Suppose we have a team. Uh, I, I run an event actually back at, uh, in Kansas City, back in the States, and so this is my team. And, uh, and say we just have the four of us and we want to loop through and, and, and list our names and string padding works exactly the way you would expect, right? We can call pad start, put the strings in there, right? Put a string in and optionally a fill character or a fill mask, right? It can be a fill string and it'll do exactly what you would probably expect it to do. You call it pad start of eight, and I'm basically, like in this example, I'm right aligning my strings, right? Making them up to eight characters long. If I don't provide that optional mask, it's white space. If I provide something, it's the character or the mask I wanna put in. And uh, again, probably predictably, if, the, if I said, say, pad start four, or pad start two, like nothing would happen. Like it doesn't blow up, it just, it just wouldn't do anything. It would ignore that string. Uh, also, there is a pad end, works the exact same way, so you have equal length strings, 
And uh, what's the opposite of padding strings? Anyone? Trimming strings. So obviously we have pad start and pad end, and we have trim start and trim end, right? Except, except we don't. <laughs> because we have trim left and trim right, which already existed, and they haven't fixed it yet because it is still JavaScript. We don't really want it like, to make sense. Uh, so you trim left and you trim right because that's what was always there. We have pad start and pad end, the rationale being that we have, say, right to left languages. And rather than having to have a developer worry about what is left and right, we say start and end and semantically for localization. It'll figure it out whether it should be the left or right based on the start or the end. There is a proposal to make uh, trim start and trim end. It's been like two years. We think it's coming soon, but it's not there yet. Sorry. Uh, okay. Who's using async await already in JavaScript? Hopefully a lot of people, but sweet. Okay, cool. So this is really one of the biggest things that came out of 2017, uh, and I think one of the most applicable that everyone can really benefit from. So if you haven't used async await uh, in JavaScript, have you, are people here, what, people with backgrounds and other technologies, .NET developers, C Sharp people? So this works similarly to the way async await works with task-based programming principles in C Sharp, uh, practically the same. So let's take sort of what things used to look like. Who remembers like this callback hell, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's not pretty, and there's a lot of problems with it. Other than the ugliness, and this is like simple, right? Because I haven't actually really put anything in these functions, but if we actually started putting things in, uh, it gets very messy. Uh, it's hard to maintain, it's hard to read, it's all the weird indentation stuff going on. Also, it's hard to debug. Also, it's hard to handle errors. There's lots of problems with callbacks. Also, there's the problem with this, everyone's favorite JavaScript word, and what on earth this is at any point in time. Uh, not easy. So things got a lot better with the Promises API. Um, and in fact, this isn't bad. Are people use, who's using Promises or have, has used Promises in JavaScript? Most of you, awesome. So this is a lot better. It's certainly easier to read, right? But it's still not perfect. Um, Error handling is easier, but not great. Um, this is still a single JavaScript statement, like one expression, right? There's one semicolon. This whole thing happens at once, so placing breakpoints in here can be difficult, and you can't really debug, say, arrow functions. You can debug inside of each of these, but if something breaks, it's hard to necessarily tell where it happened. So debugging is hard, and let's say that actually, what, what happens if on, on save data, I needed A? Well, A went out of scope when it's, uh, when, when it's arrow function ended. So I have to do more work to hold on to and do things with A and B by the time I get to C, which becomes sort of a scoping problem depending on what our needs are. So async await fixes all of that. Like I said, if you've worked with, uh, with tasks, for example, in C Sharp, it looks just like this for the most part, right? We have an async function with the await keyword. A couple key points, you have to call the function async uh, if you want to use the await keyword. And the await keyword effectively does exactly what you would think. There is no callback. It just sits there until load data is done or until save data is done, process the data is done, and it unwraps the promise. So the assumption here is that load data returns a promise, and when load data returns the promise, what happens is the promise not only is awaited, but it is unwrapped, and whatever that promise resolves to, that's what's stored in A. A doesn't receive the promise. A receives the promise, uh, the, the, the resolved value of the promise which is also important to remember because you can get into tr trouble if you forget to put a weight because it won't blow up. If I forget to put a weight on one of those lines, it, it'll work, and now A will be the, the promise. It won't be resolved, and you have to do something with it. So make sure you've got to put it in there. Now, um, one of the things, is aside from the obvious of, hey, I still have A the whole time, is this looks just like synchronous code. Right? It works the same way you'd write any other code, which means we can handle our error handling the same way, we can place breakpoints the same way, it is just much easier to work in most paradigms. There's a couple of uh, points there. Let's say if I go back one real quick, notice on this one I'm just like logging out, right? I go through, we're loading some data, some more data, process it, save it, output something to the console, that's fine. But what if I want to return something back? So asynchronous functions always will wrap uh, the result in a promise, when it leaves. So if I return D, it doesn't actually return D, it returns a promise that resolves to D. If for whatever reason there's an exception, this asynchronous function will throw with a promise that will resolve to that exception, to that error. 
if D was for whatever reason already a promise, it is smart enough to not double wrap the promise. It won't be a promise that resolves to a promise that resolves to D, it will check. If it's already a promise, it returns that, and if it isn't, it will wrap it and send it back. Okay. Uh, one way that I use this is this idea of pro uh, multiple prerequisites. Anyone use promise.all? Does anyone use promise.all and really love promise.all? Sweet, yeah, right, right. So look at an example here. Is, let's say I need to do something, right, and I'm gonna process data, but processing data requires that I get stuff from source A and stuff from source B, and both those things are needed to process. I don't care which one gets done first. I just want them both to go. So I say, all right, go load those two data sets, and we call promise.all. This is not new, right? This is how the promise API works. I can wait, and I say promise.all on an array of promises, and when they have all successfully returned, then my, uh, my, my callback hits, and results is itself an array that contains results set A and results set B, but then aside from kind of, again, getting back into sort of the callback stuff, we also have issues where Process data probably doesn't expect an array, so then you gotta like somehow splat out the results with the, with the spread operator or something. There's stuff you gotta do to make all of this work. Uh, async await, I, feel like, I just feel like it looks better here because I can just await the whole thing and promise.all itself returns a promise that resolves that array, so I can await the entire thing. So if I await promise.all, I'm gonna get back that array, I'm gonna get back what was results on the pre pre uh, previous slide and I can just destructure it again into A and B. And now, again, I have A and B in scope. I can continue to use A and B after the next line in case I want to go back to it. But, and I can easily call process data, do whatever I want with it. Cleans it up. Uh, here's the catch, is this idea of awaiting at the top. You can't, you can't do that. And what I mean by that is, say, this is my entire application. That will fail because the global scope isn't asynchronous. Right? Remember, you can't use the await keyword unless you are in an async scope. I'm not in an async scope, you try to call await and it blows up at runtime and says you can't, you can't do that. Now the fix for that, they're working on that. There is a proposal where that will happen, we think, eventually. But if you really have to do this, and I'm not necessarily recommending that you do this because I don't think you should always be in an asynchronous scope all the time, but you can create an asynchronous iffy. So you can actually create an iffy and call it async from the outset, and now everything inside that file is async, and you can use await wherever you want inside your entire scope. It's no longer really the global scope, right, because things could happen outside that iffy, but you can effectively wrap the whole thing if you really want to. Uh, any questions about any of those things? Not just the async await, but anything. If people have questions, like, feel free to throw your hand up or whatnot. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in progress? Cancellation, Cancellation circuit, yeah, in progress. Um, and we'll talk about what in progress means. Uh, the question about cancellation tokens, things, uh, we'll talk about what in process means in general for, uh, for in a little bit later. Um, it's not necessarily a great answer, right? Because it's like, well, it, it's coming, uh, but not necessarily in perfect kind of production form now. Um, any other questions? Okay, cool. So a few other things that happened. Uh, trailing commas, none of these are necessarily huge. Uh, trailing commas is kind of a, uh, a small change where you cannot, uh, you can't necessarily have like a comma at the end of your argument list. So you can't have a function definition that expects a comma b comma c comma close friend. Now you can. That's not a big deal for me. Depending on your coding practices and your standards, that, where that becomes helpful is if you have, uh, you know, if, if, if you decide that you have to keep your arguments on every line, then when you make a change, you don't necessarily have like extra lines in your change log if you look at your commits and stuff because it's not deleting a line to re-edit just because of a comma. Okay. Uh, descriptors. So there is a, you can call object dot get own, uh, get own property descriptors. Uh, there's always been one for a given property. I don't know if anyone's ever used that, but you can call get own property descriptor on a property in an object. There's now a get own property descriptors on an object, and what it will do is that will return a, a giant object of every enumerable property, or every property of the object, not only with its property name and value, but also whether it is writable, whether it's enumerable, whether it's configurable, the descriptors on that property, so you can kind of get a holistic picture of your entire object literal. 
Uh, and the shared memory in atomics is actually a fascinating space to be in if you, are, if you deal with a lot of concurrency and parallelism in JavaScript. It does a lot of stuff with like shared memory and things like that to handle uh, better parallelism. The problem is, right after they released it, there were issues with Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities, and most browsers have completely disabled it. Um, it was great. That, I have another talk that's on multi-threaded JavaScript, and right after starting Accepted, all the browsers started turning off the feature because of all the problems, which is pretty awesome. So they're working on fixing that, but most environments won't support it anymore. All right. 2018, so that's stuff that is new to the spec in the last couple months in terms of being officially set. A couple things, uh, rest and spread properties. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, the rest and spread operator, people use it? Yes. Sweet, okay. The rest and spread operator works on arrays, but it, wasn't, it didn't really work on objects. It didn't work from a property standpoint before. So for, if, if you aren't using it, just a quick refresher, right? If, we were talking about you know, our three dots, our ellipsis. Uh, it's funny, I actually, for a while, I just called it the splat operator, because I feel either way, you're just splatting things out, and it has multiple names. Right? But if we use it as, uh, in the spread syntax, see, if we didn't use that here, and we tried to just say array to three, four, five, six, we'd actually get an array with four objects in it, right? Where the first element is that whole array, so we splat it out. And same thing with rest parameters, we can take all the stuff we have, and if we, the rest of them get wrapped into an array that we can use, say, like the array prototype functions and stuff like that on. But now we can do stuff with object initializers, and, uh, and it's kind of neat. So suppose I've got these two objects, person and work, person's me, work, like worldwide technology, St. Louis, whatever. If I want to create a user, and I use the spread operator on person and work, like this, it actually pops off. It's kind of like uh, object.assign. Right, it's like really a syntactic sort around object out of sign, where I can take all, but I can do it all at once, where I can take uh, each one of these properties, spread all the properties from them, and put them into a resulting object. And at the end of the day, what user looks like doesn't have a property called person or work. What it really has is first and last, and company and location, and anything else I wanted to add to it in a single object. Conversely, we're talking about when it's the rest operator instead of the spread operator. Do the same thing. Let's say I want to take person and I want to say destructure that object. So I can destructure that into first, last, and the rest. And I'm going to end up with three new variables. First and last will have Jeff and Strauss. Info will have the rest of them packaged with those others removed. It's pretty neat. Also worth noticing. Uh, you can do the same thing. You could always do this in destructuring, but the same stuff works. So you can use the colon syntax. They don't have to be called first and last. I can call them whatever I, whatever I want to call them. Okay. So other thing, async iteration. Uh, for of loop. We talked about we've seen the for of loop already. For of loop's not new, right? That's the thing with the iterables, where I've got an array, uh, and we iterate over an iterable thing. You couldn't do it asynchronously before. This is uh, pretty powerful. So let's say we've got a traditional loop. I've got some collection of values that's iterable. I loop over them. I log them out. No big deal. Easy. But what if instead of values, I've got some function that is asynchrony generating and yielding something back? This doesn't, this doesn't work. Get values now as a generator or some sort of asynchronous deal that's returning a promise or who knows what it's doing, but what it's not is an array. Right? It's not some sort of iterable thing, so it, it blows up. We fix that. Uh, well, you know, and there's a lot of cases for this, right? Like file IO, streams, and things like that. But we fix it with a new loop, the for await of loop. OK. <laughs> right. I know. It's really, really creative. Uh, but the way it works is we don't await the thing inside. And I think this is an important distinction, OK? So, I don't mean that get values is just an async function that does something once that's asynchronous and you wait a little bit and then it comes back. You could have done that already. You could have said for let item of await get values. It'll do the thing once. You await it and you have your thing back. That's not a big deal. As long as the thing that comes back is an array or something iterable, right? But I'm talking about things that are generators and that sort of deal where, or streams, where every time I go out, I'm yielding a value and I have to wait every time. On every pass of the loop, I might be waiting for a thing to come back each time through. So you put a, a wait outside the parentheses, the for await of loop, and now what happens is every single time I go and get a value, 
it runs, when it gets back to the top of the loop, it will wait again for the next value to be yielded. So that works, uh, and you can build your own of these, right, because you just build generators. So the same way that something iterable worked before, if you've ever built your own iterable uh, object in JavaScript, right, the thing basically returns a, th this object of value and done. So either you get a value back and done is false, or it is done, done is true, and value is null. So by the same token, we, we just have it return a promise that results to that thing. And that's it. And if you just create basically like a, func like a generator function, but now you can call that generate function itself async. Now you use the full weight of loop and you can loop over those things. Questions? Makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is the four weight of loop in TypeScript? I'm not, I'm not a TypeScript developer. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of TypeScript. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Someone may know the answer to that. I do not. Does anyone know if this is in TypeScript? I believe it is. I, I have this weird, I know that TypeScript is the way things go. I have this thing where like, I feel like everything C sharps all the things, and I feel like TypeScript, I, I, I know there's like a whole argument to be had there, but I don't know. Um, okay, so a few other things from 2018 and these really are like little smaller things, is uh, the Promise API didn't have a finally before. To be honest with you, I didn't even realize that, which I don't know if that means I'm a bad programmer and I just never really used finallys in my try-catch stuff or what, but it wasn't there. So now, now it is. Um, template literals, there were some restrictions on hex and octal and like Unicode type things. And remember, template literals are like the dollar sign backtick sort of stuff where you can tokenize your strings. Um, there were restrictions there that had been removed. There's a lot of regex stuff. Uh, with look behind, look behind assertions and some more Unicode things and a handful of cool regular expression updates. Uh, I know regular expressions are like either you love them or you hate them. I really like them a lot, but if you hate them, you probably hate me for even talking about them. Uh, and then another thing that I actually am not sure I realized uh, until I saw, I was like, oh yeah. Um, you can't have a catch that just is a catch. You have to define the exception that comes in the catch block, and you don't have to anymore. You can just generally have a global catch that doesn't actually define like an, an exception variable in it, and that's now okay. So, hopefully, I'm not I feel bad at the camera. I keep walking this way, but it's going to fall off if I put it there. So, ES next, ES next. So that's kind of the what of where things are right now and some of the new stuff that's going on. But like, okay, that stuff's really cool. But man, Jeff, you've mentioned a few things like uh, like, like the cancellation tokens or like the uh, you know, some of the other stuff that's coming up. When's all that coming? I mean, is there like there is a lot of stuff, and it's coming. I promise, at some point. And what are those things? Like the top level await. Oh, I mentioned this, right? You can't uh, you you can't have an await in the global scope, and you have to do like the async iffy. They're working on that. Top level await. Uh, there's going to be like a function style import to r try to actually standardized like a model, a module loader. And standardized across all different frameworks that already decided how they want to do this thing, but they're all kind of different. Looking to standardize that through a function style import. Uh, all sorts of stuff with classes. I have a giant soapbox. Speaking of see, the TypeScript thing, like I have a thing about classes in JavaScript. Um, I always say like you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think that it means. Um, but some of the problems are things like access modifiers. So there's been a raging debate for like over a year among the, the committee about private and public access modifiers for insta instance method variable or instance variables and functions and, and objects. In addition to that, they're looking at being able to add static methods and even following on from that, things like a decorator pattern. Like there's some really cool stuff that's coming into JavaScript. So when is all that stuff coming? I don't know. And I'm sorry. And I always feel like if I said that right off the bat, people just all get up and leave the talk. It's like, oh, he doesn't know what's coming. But here's the thing. Uh, we kind of know. We can make educated guesses. Uh, we can have a decent idea of what's happening. But to understand how to do that, like first, I, what I want to do is kind of take a, take a little stroll through the Wayback Time Machine and kind of talk about why JavaScript is the way it is. Who is this guy? Anyone know? Brendan Yes, sir. Brendan Dyke. I'd give you a t-shirt if I had one. <laughs> That's Brendan Ike. Brendan Ike. Back in May of 1995, was hired by these guys. Remember them? So he was hired to create a scripting style language that was somewhat Java-like, 
uh, to support the burgeoning World Wide Web. And famously or infamously, many of you probably already know over the story, like in 10 caffeine-filled, like fever dream, fever dream days, he produced JavaScript. If you ever want to know more than any other reason why JavaScript is weird, remember, he did it in 10 days, and we've been fixing it ever since. Um, so for Netscape Navigator, I think it was like 2.0 beta 3 in November 95, JavaScript 1 was released, not ECMAScript, JavaScript, version 1. Now, it had problems, still has problems. But one of the things that came up from that is uh, these guys came along, and I don't, I don't want to say they reverse engineered it, uh, but, but they did. And uh, by like August of the next year, they released JScript with IE3, which was like JavaScript, except that it wasn't. And a few things happened because of JScript. Like, important things happened because of like, the horror that was JScript. Is, aside from the fact that it was kind of the beginning of like, the browser wars that, can, that started then and kind of continue, um, by this point, like, Netscape has kind of folded in and become part of Mozilla. Brett and Likes moved to Mozilla. They took a step back and they said, gosh, you know, when you reach the point that Microsoft is stealing your stuff and doing something with it, like, you've probably hit the nail on the head really well. Like, we got something going on here. Uh, but also, there was this idea of JScript didn't really work. We can all laugh about how nothing works in IE. But it's not that IE was a bad browser. It's that we had all these different implementations. So what they did is they submitted, Mozilla, Brennan Eich and all them, submitted JavaScript to ECMA, which is actually not the European Computer Manufacturers Association. But because ECMA is a weird word, I always, that's, that's what it, it once was. When it became a global organization, they just sort of ditched this, and now they're just ECMA. And they submitted the language to ECMA and said, please help, please fix. So ECMA did that. And in uh, June of 97, they released ECMA 262. That is ECMAScript, version one. This is 1997, ECMA one. Now, it seemed like everything's going great. The next year, they had an ECMA release, like ECMA version 2 was in 98, ECMA version 3 was in 99, and then like, it just stopped. Why did it stop? Because the people, and this is still today, the pe have people heard of TC39? Anyone familiar with this term? TC39 is the group of people, organizations, what have you, that decide what features do and don't make it into the ECMAScript standard. Um, it's Technical Committee 39. Some people say TC39 Committee. Please don't do that. The C stands for committee. It like, makes me cringe. It's like the Technical Committee 39 Committee. Don't, don't, don't do that. Uh, the TC39 is this group of people. They meet all the time, and they decide what to do. But the trouble is TC39 is composed of, of uh, representatives from companies like, like this. Big companies, major stakeholders in the web don't always get along, don't always have the same ideas, conflicts, fights. So right after ECMAScript 3 happened in 99, the IE team and like the Mozilla, Brendan Ike team just stopped playing nice. Like they, they, they just, they had disagreements, they weren't really coming to the table and cooperating, and everything stalled completely. Like ECMA 4 was supposed to come out, it never did. Then it kind of was relabeled, you know, ECMA 3.1. It still never did. Eventually, like in 2009, 10 years later, ES5 came out, um, which was sometimes called ES Harmony, if you remember that term from several years back. So it took 10 years to get anything done. And then there was like a small upgrade in 5.1. But then again, nothing happened until we had ES6, right, in 2015, which is what started the whole ECMA 2015, ES 2016, ES 2017. And the reason that's happened is because by the time we got to 2015, they started realizing that the committee is nice, but design by committee doesn't work. Because there are too many conflicts of interest, too many different opinions, and so they grind to like a, like a stalemate. And we were going nowhere. And as a result, we now have what is literally just called the TC39 process which is where we are today and how the language grows today. The way they handle it is proposals go through a series of stages. Uh, every single proposal, every one, goes through the same series of stages. It doesn't matter if it is fixing the problem of left pad or building async iteration or designing an entire flawed class system for, for JavaScript. Whatever it is, 
they all go through the same steps in order to make it in the into the spec. We'll talk real quickly about what those are. And this is how we start to figure out where things are going and why. So stage zero, because we're engineers and everything has to be zero based, we can't start at one. Um, stage zero is called the straw man stage. Uh, it's actually okay that we call it stage zero because it really isn't anything at all. A proposal goes into stage zero, like anyone with any vested interest or any stakeholder in, in, in ECMA can basically say, here is a thing, and like throw it over the wall and see what happens. Lots of proposals are thrown in there as stage zero that never go anywhere at all. The idea is just to provide some sort of input to the process because we all have to start somewhere. So it's sort of, I see this thing, I have this thought, I had a dream last night, I think we should add this to JavaScript. And it, sh and, and it shows up. Now, it doesn't mean anything's happening with it. If we get to stage one, it's important. This is an important step. Because even though we're nowhere, when you, take on, when you reach stage one, this proposal stage, what it means is that this thing has at least been discussed by TC39. They've looked at it. They've said, eh, we see a problem here. We're going to invest our time in at least thinking about it, right? which is a major step, given the number of things that are proposed in the first place. And so a few things happen when a proposal is in stage one. We start talking about things like, what is the problem? What's going on? Why do we need this? Well, because there's this thing with left pad, the internet broke, and like, we really need to fix this problem. How are we going to fix it? Uh, we're going to do the exact same thing in the language. right? And talking about maybe some of the technical challenges and the hurdles. Other things that happen during stage one are you start like, like polyfills. Uh, the feature itself doesn't start getting built, but you'll see little polyfill snippets of code, like here's how the thing will work. If you call this, this is sort of the behavior that we expect. And they start playing around with that a little bit. At a certain point, uh, oh, and one other thing about stage one is not only has TC39 talked about it, but, and this is key actually, since design by committee was a problem, someone, or maybe a couple of someones, but usually it's like one prime key person running point, says, I'll take it. Someone claims it and is responsible for making the argument for it, for shepherding it through the process, for answering questions, for acknowledging if there's flaws, but making sure the thing marches ahead so that there's someone always watching it. And hopefully we avoid getting stalled. Okay. Stage two is the draft stage. Stage two means, all right, we get the idea, we understand what the problem is, we see some polyfill stuff that needs, sort of works, but we're still talking about a spec here. We're still creating something that if, if, if you ever, uh, like the ECMAScript standard itself is still a formal specification. Uh, it, like, it's like a big giant technical document. It, I wouldn't necessarily rec recommend reading it because it's really not particularly interesting, but it is a spec. And so during stage two, we start drafting what that spec looks like. We start talking about what the real syntax semantics are gonna be around this thing, not just through polyfill, but start actually looking at how would this thing work and how would, you know, because remember, right, like a browser, I'm Google Chrome, I've got the V8 engine, or I've got SpiderMonkey, or I've got Chakra for Edge, whatever it is, I've got to build these features eventually in my implementation of JavaScript, so we start working on what that might look like, how it should work, we start defining it. When we get to stage three, things are looking really good. I used to tell people, up until about a year ago, that if things hit stage three, it's just a matter of time and it's coming. Um, until I decided that wasn't true anymore, or I didn't decide, but until I started seeing a couple of things that made it to stage three that have been in discussion for a long time fall flat to like never be heard of again. So even after something that seems so close, it does not mean it'll be part of the language. And that can be a little tricky and dangerous if you're trying to plan ahead for the future. Because when we're in the candidate stage, what that means is we've only gone, we can go so far writing our own little kind of implementations but what TC39 says is, OK, we're ready to move forward. We aren't going to publish this thing and say it's real until we have at least two real world implementations in real world environments that have built this thing where you can use it, where someone could write applications using the feature, and you can actually run it natively in those environments. You have to have a successful implementation in at least two environments and get the feedback and see where that goes outside of like the ivory tower of TC39 just saying, well, this sounds nice. You have to actually see it go out in the real world and work. The problem is, so like I said, a couple years ago, there was a, or a year and a half ago maybe, there was a thing called like SIMD, single instruction, multiple data type instructions. It didn't work. Like in the real world, it was more headache and hassle than it was worth, and it dropped. And after all this discussion, it just sort of went away. Yeah. 
sometimes when I see something that kind of stalls in stage three, I get nervous actually about it. Because, you know, like, like for example, the private and public classes thing, uh, methods has, has stalled for a long time in stage three, and it kind of gets me anxious because I want them to fix classes. Uh, so, point is though, we don't know what'll happen until we see it. Now, if we're successful, then it's stage four and it's done. If it's not successful and it gets dumped, the reason I say it's dangerous is because now you actually have maybe a feature that is fully native in, say, Chrome or in Safari or whatever that is actually not going to be a standardized thing. And whether or not they ever actually deprecate it and remove it back out of, say, V8, maybe they do, maybe they don't. So you see a feature that works like, oh, well, at least it's in Chrome now. Our users use Chrome. That's great because you're planning ahead, but you've got to be careful because maybe it will never, ever end up in all the other environments. So you've got to look out. But if it hits stage four, it is truly done. And stage four means we've tested it, we're happy, and at the next release, it will become part of the spec, which is in January of every year, and then it's ratified like in June, and then it's done. So it's all the standard stuff. So that every proposal works that way, every single proposal. Now, what do we do with that? Because there's a bunch, right? Like there's a, there's a bunch. And it's hard to keep track of things. And it's hard to know how to plan. And the whole point of this, and the reason I talk about this, is because there will be new features next year and the year after that. And so you don't necessarily want to be reactionary. It's nice to be proactive about our, about our development. So the good news is like GitHub actually helps here. Because all of this, all of it, is done in the open. The entire process is done in the open. Every proposal, every discussion, every meeting, it's all in GitHub. TC39 has an organization in GitHub with a whole bunch of repos, and there's an ECMA 262, because remember that's actually the formal name of ECMAScript. There's, a, there's, there's an ECMA 262 repo that's sort of a launching point for everything they do. And it's kind of, you know, the, the, the readme for that repo is largely just kind of talking about the process, a link to like, here's how the process works, and also uh, links to all these other things. So for example, there's a link from that main repo into another one that has all the finished stuff, everything is stage four, everything that's going on, which is one through three, stage zero stuff, and even things that get dropped. So the 7D proposal, which has never been completed and will never be completed, still exists. You can still see what happened, find out why, see the progress that was made. It just becomes inactive. So you can track and see what's happening with every single one of them, and every single feature gets its own repository its own polyfills, its own text, its own discussion, its own issues, because in, aside from the ECMAScript standard being a standard, it is actually treated like a real repo, so the standard itself takes pull requests, and so that proposal sits out somewhere else in another repo, and when it becomes stage four, when the time is right, then that proposal, whatever it is, you know, async iteration or private instance uh, fields, gets a pull request back into the main ECMA 262 repo and becomes part of the spec that way. So each different proposal has its own thing. The nice thing there, aside from being, you know, there's a whole lot of repositories to track maybe, but if it's something you really care about, like you can star or watch just that one. I get way too many emails, sometimes I wish I didn't do this, I get so many emails like every day with a discussion of what's going on with the public and private field stuff in classes, but it's a very active discussion, and I just, I just watch that repo. And I can ignore all the other stuff if I don't care about it. Now, uh, in addition to that, there's a couple other repos that are kind of interesting. Uh, there's this test 262. So this is a giant suite of tests, not only tests that exist across the board for the whole spec, but then one of the things you have to do when we create a new proposal is we have to have tests around that. So you can actually download these things, and I haven't done this in a long time, but you can run these tests in your environment and find out. Again, not to harp on the IE thing, but something that's kind of funny is IE, for a long time, was actually more compliant with the ECMAScript standard than like Chrome and Firefox were. Because Chrome and Firefox actually are doing some things where they build a lot more uh, of like the experimental stuff, stage three stuff. And IE was like, it maybe didn't work the way we wanted it to work, but it worked the way it was supposed to work. Uh, but you can do that and test your environments uh, through this test suite, which would be kind of an interesting exercise. Uh, in addition, this is not really part of TC39's repo, but it's this guy, Rick Waldron. Rick Waldron is a, uh, is a representative member to the committee. But what he does is, I don't know if he's officially the secretary for TC39 or not, but he takes incredibly detailed notes of everything that happens. Because TC39, every other month, all year round, every year, every other month, they all get together in person somewhere, and they meet. And they talk about these things. And everything that's discussed about every proposal, whether it's moved up or why not, what's going on, 
all those notes are there, readily available. So you can kind of see what's happening with your favorite features that matter to you. Uh, okay. I used to have a talk where I refer to this next slide as the worst slide in the history of slides ever, ever made. Uh, and, it's, and it still is. But uh, there's a purpose to it now. So that guy. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen this page before? Anyone familiar with it? I see a handful of people. This thing is maintained uh, by just a guy out of New York, I think is where he lives. And this is, you know, if we actually showed the whole thing, it would go down like, you know, somewhere down there in the lobby of the hotel. It's like a huge page that shows all these different features and proposals and things that are going on, and also shows across, you know, it goes way out to there, every single environment that might exist. And whether that feature has been implemented natively in that environment or not. Now, setting aside this first part, which is like polyfill stuff, you'll notice this page, 2016 features, 2017 features, I just took a new snapshot, this is this morning. A lot of green. That's good news. Because something to keep in mind is just because something becomes stage four and becomes part of the spec, doesn't mean that it actually, bless you, doesn't mean that it actually exists in every single browser or every single environment because they do stuff to go out and build that thing and make it work. So these features, since this is 2016, it's a good thing it's all green, but shows you whether in the browser or the environment you care about where that feature works. Now it's an interactive page, so if you haven't been to this page before or even if you have, you should play around with it. If you click next, it looks more like that. That's not as good, but there's some light, light here. So let's look like over here, right? Uh, Object.from entries, just a proposal that's going on right now. Actually, that'll be the thing where, when we looked about object.entries, about the stuff from 2017, that took, that was my whole family and we could iterate over the object. This is a proposal to take that same thing, if you have that array of key value uh, pairs, to serialize that back into an object literal. Um, that is, is, it's built here in these Firefox nightlies, right? Chrome's got something going on with a big int type. That's here because these things are in stage three. This is helpful, what we're trying to plan, because what you can see is things are happening with it. Not only is it in stage three, but you can see the ones that have more activity, like the string prototype dot match all, I don't know how easy this is to read from that, like the third one down, these guys, like there's a lot of red here. Now it's possible that somewhere over here there's green, right? But, it may well be that something's in stage three, but no one's built anything for it yet, which tells us, well, that's gonna be a while. It's in stage three, but it's, it, it's probably gonna be a while. That doesn't mean it's coming like next week. So you can kind of plan and think about what's happening feature by feature, which is nice. Um, oh, there's a bit.ly for that. So if you just do like ECMA-compat, that'll take you to that, just to that page, okay? Um, and then one other thing is this ES discuss. Um, this is if you really want to like get into the weeds and really want to geek out on this stuff. But uh, not only are there all the repos and all the issues in GitHub and things you can track, there's a long running mailing distribution list for the ECMA standard um, that's been around forever. This is kind of a nice indexed site that lets you track all that stuff. And there's a lot of historical stuff there too, which can be interesting if you just, if, if, if you care about this stuff even more than really is reasonable. But, even current stuff is here. So not only does it have links to like say the notes that Rick Waldron does, but there are links actively updated all the time on what's going on on the mailing list. So you can see not only the discussion that's happening in GitHub, but everything that's going back as we track, like why, what's the hang up? Why can't we figure out how to create private fields in classes? Well, there's a lot of discussion there. And it's sorted uh, not only by date, but by topic, also by proposal. So it's very easy to navigate and find a lot of information about the things that you care about. Okay, questions about any of this? Awesome. So what does that mean, and why do we care, and where do we go? Uh, really what I just want people to do is just like, is, is think about this stuff, right? You don't have to think about it every day. Don't like spend entire like work weeks like obsessing over one feature or the next, unless you hate JavaScript classes. Um, but invest time in understanding how it works, right? Educate yourself about the things that matter, because if there's something that you don't like in the language today, it might be getting worked on. Or if not, you might be able to propose, or, or somehow, maybe not directly, but throw something out there, right? Find these people. You, it, it's easy to even see who's on these committees. There are people who, I don't know if there's anyone here at NDC, but there, I mean, I've been at conferences where there are speakers who are actually part of TC39. You go to an event like this, you literally might be able to walk up to someone and say, hey, I've been having this thought. And you can have a direct impact on that, and just sort of educate how this thing works. 
Maybe you can be part of the fix, and at the very least, you can have a better sense of what's coming. And then discuss all that stuff with your teams. Don't just let it be you. Go back and talk to your team about it, because then what you can do is you can really empower everybody, everyone on your team, to really plan ahead better, safer, maybe a little bit more foolproof. You still have the big purple question mark. Like, you don't know for sure. And in truth, you know, think about even things like the atomics and the shared memory buffers, which even when it made to stage four, then we had like the meltdown specter problems. So you, nothing's perfect. But the more you know, right? So empower your teams, plan better for the future. That's all. Questions on anything at all? Yes, sir. Uh, where do you see Babel's role? What do I see is Babel's role. Well, I certainly don't think Babel's going away. Um, and Babel kind of plays in this space. I don't know if they have anyone on TC39. Um, but you'll notice like on that, on the Kangex, like the, you know, on the big feature compatibility side, like Babel and Trace, those things are all listed as well. Um, when ES6 was new, um, I had a talk on that, because that was like when all the big stuff happened at once. And I frequently got the question, so we have to use Babel now. When does that go away? And I said, like, I, I, don't, I don't think it does. Um, I could be wrong. But I think that uh, Babel is just an important part. It's just become one of our build tools, right? It's just, it's just part of how we do things. It used to be you just wrote some JavaScript and just worked or didn't or worked here and here and here but not there and there. And it's just become like we, it, in a lot of ways, I think of JavaScript as having matured as a language and matured as an ecosystem through sheer force of will because it seems to be like the one language to rule them all, like it or not, you know? And so I think that um, in, in that respect, I, I don't think it's going away. I think they're just an important player like anybody else. I, I think that... Um, it's just part of what we do. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you're, if, if that's really what you're asking, or if you think that Babel is going to sort of like sunset at some point. It, it's more that you know, with Babel, it's just it's a lot more connected, and uh, we're going to. Oh, I see. I see. Really I see. <sighs> so, so the question was, does it, right? Is does, Babel, does all this stuff really even matter? Does it matter what's really formally in the spec or whether anything makes it a stage forward? Because we have Babel to fix that problem anyway. Um, but that's, I think, only true to a point. Um, Babel isn't standardized or governed the same way that ECMA's standards are. Um, there's no guarantee that they won't sunset or deprecate something. So there's no guarantee. Just because Babel was working on, say, say an implementation in stage three, something drops that they uh, won't get rid of it or that they'll do it the same way. And for that matter, um, you know, one of the reasons, like, like uh, briefly mentioned on the stuff that's coming up in the ES Next, like the import, the function style import for module loaders, that's going to be a challenge maybe for, for Babel. I mean, because a lot of stuff, when you look at how Node does it or how React was doing it, uh, you know, there, since there wasn't a standard, they all started deciding how they wanted to do it themselves. Um, that is actually difficult for Babel. I mean, I mean, the import in particular may be one of the hardest things Babel has to deal with because they've already found ways to solve like, the problem and now it isn't consistent across the board. So, so yes, in a way, Babel solves some of our problems, but, um, but it's not a single point of truth. It's more like a fix because at any given point in time, that point of truth is a, is a moving target. Uh, and so I think, it, and, the, and the idea should be that over time, like Babel shouldn't necessarily be down converting your arrow functions back into like the horribly hideous looking stuff that arrow functions get turned into when you actually see it in ES5 and earlier code. I mean, if you ever really look at what Babel turns, and I'm, sh I'm sure you have, like if you really look at the stuff that is output from Babel, like that's not necessarily what we really want running in our, bra in our browsers natively forever, right? What we want are features that because they're built natively over time, we stop transpiling those things and let the native environments run them in the way that, they, that they're built to be optimized to run. Um, it's kind of a long-winded answer, I guess, because it's like more of a philosophical thing, I guess. But, um, but, I, but I don't think it solves all the problems. I think that it's, it's an important tool as the problems continue to be solved, I suppose. It's an interesting conversation, though. Hmm. Anything? Yeah? Uh, Node.js plays in the same space. So again, like Node has a whole section on that on the compatibility chart, the same. You know, um, Node, doesn't Node run on V8, I think, right? So. Um, so in a lot of respects, like Node is a part of like anything else. I talk a lot about browsers because you know, a lot of our historic pain with JavaScript uh, was you know, why isn't this thing working in my mobile browser the way I expect, and so things are standardized. But uh, the same rules apply. Like Node, Node runs on V8. V8 is an implementation of the ECMAScript standard. And so as these things mature and evolve and new features come in, the same things go into Node. Now, Node 
seems to sometimes prioritize different things in a different order because the needs are different. You know, the, the, the problems that Node is solving are different from the problems maybe that we're solving in a, in a, in a web space. But it's still, you know, it's, it's still kind of one standard. And that's why I talked, you know, the, the joke at the very beginning with, with the JavaScript and all the different browsers, right? Which is, um, they're all just stakeholders and no, the Node.js community is just another stakeholder in what happens to the future of the language. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> do, do, I, do I think that we will ever be satisfied with the state of JavaScript? <laughs> That's such a loaded question. Um, no. Um, I, I wish the answer were yes. That'd be nice. Um, no. No, because we're fickle, and no, because we're demanding, and no, because like all of us, you know, it's, it's like, hey, shiny new object, that's nice. I want the next shiny new object, um, and we've come to a point where we've gotten used to that, and now, especially because of the month, the year by year releases, we're like, oh, this is nice. Let's get the next thing. Um, part of that, I think, again, just like the question about Node, I think it comes out of the same situation, that w which is that JavaScript was this like scripting thing for the web, which turned into the scripting thing everywhere, which turned into mobile stuff and Electron and Node and like the. Uh, and, and because even the, you know I, when I say JavaScript is the one language to rule them all, I don't really mean that. Like it's kind of tongue in cheek, but like from a from a globalist standpoint, point, like it, it it sort of is being treated that way. And because we try to use JavaScript in so many different places, in so many different ways, we keep finding new ways to do it. And because of that, we're going to keep finding new things to do to change the language. And it's like this weird cycle thing. So do I really think that? I mean, have you ever have you ever really met a like a, a developer that is actually truly satisfied with anything, including their own code. I mean, it just isn't a isn't a thing. I mean, um, that, that may just be my experience. But but I, do I think that things will change over time? I mean, there's other look, there's other stuff like some of the WebAssembly things and, and sort of that's coming. You know, if you in the .NET space, we look at things like Blazor and some of the cool stuff that's happening there. Do I think those things are going to replace JavaScript? You know, as, as, as soon as you raise your hand and say no, no, it's never going anywhere. Like this is the thing forever. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the thing forever. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's going away anytime soon, and I don't think that the process and the evolution of the language is going to stop anytime soon. Um, it may become just one of a number of things. That's my completely like one person's two cents about you know. But that's my opinion of it. Yep. Yep. Um, well, so I've sort of, uh, what feature am I most excited about? So all the stuff going on with classes, and which I kind of hinted at, I get, and I'm going to avoid the soapbox about them, I, th I think. Um, but so, so I, but I, I really don't like them. Um, and of course, the reason is because, here's the thing with it. it couldn't we have called it something else? Right? But we call them classes. And the trouble is, JavaScript is like a prototype-based language, right? And prototypal inheritance is not classical inheritance. They're not the same. They don't work the same way. And so when people who aren't just JavaScript developers, but are .NET developers or Java developers or whatever else, who also have to do JavaScript now because we all do, we hear, oh, there's classes now. But they don't work the way you think. And um, so the reason I like it is because I think they may become more palatable. And originally, it was this idea of just like private fields. Um, and then there are private and, and, and public fields and static stuff. And it, so it's not just about the one proposal. What's interesting is that it used to be just one proposal. It was like private instance methods. And now it's split and then split again. And there's the static stuff and the public and the private stuff and the decorator stuff. And there's a lot of really cool things. So if we're going to accept that classes are a thing, and that's how we're going to, and especially with things like TypeScript, like the sooner that we can get truly effective classes in place, the sooner that TypeScript can be like a sensible paradigm that sits on top of JavaScript instead of a thing that really doesn't work like JavaScript at all. So I think all those features coming to get together as a group are great um, because I think that they will make something that at least for me personally, I find to be horribly like not palatable, palatable to become more so. And I think make them at least feel a lot more like, like what a lot of us would expect them to be in the first place. Uh, but again, like I think, the, I think it's been stage three I think for two years now, um, and it's still a very active discussion. Um, 
And it's not, there's so much going on, and a lot of it's technical details, right? Because it's, well, how are we going to do that? What should the syntax look like? How can we have sensible syntax that won't like step on top of something else that's already there? So there's all, I mean, and some of the syntax is actually, I think, still think kind of weird. But I'd look at those, that, because if you use classes in your JavaScript today, those will fundamentally change the way you are building your classes. Um, and there'll be a lot of new syntax loss that goes around it. So if you're going to look at one thing or group of things, I'd, I'd look at those. Because I, I don't think, I do think they are going to make it to stage four, hopefully soon. Um, I have no idea where we are in time. I, the questions are great. Are we there? Are we out of time? Yeah? Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening and enjoy the rest of NBC.